I'm going to talk to you quite conceptually at first about how we think about sustainability and ESG and then I'm going to give you some more, a little bit more practical information around how we actually manage it. Um, I thought I'd start though with setting myself a bit of a trap because one of the things that I find very difficult, particularly as a bank or representing a bank, is the emotive elements of sustainability and ESG. And I, I often wonder, you know, where does this thing fit in in terms of where we are in our economy's life cycle and in the world's life cycle? So this is a, this is a picture that I particularly like. It hangs at the MoMA in New York, and it's by an artist named Barnett Newman. And it's about, it's done in about 1950, and it's about the post-World War II world, where people fundamentally had a choice. You could say the world has been as bad as it can get, and it can stay bad, or we can move on in a different direction and look at things with a different, more positive light. Um, I'm then going to overlay that with some words from a, a poem that I really like, also by an American, that I think speaks to, so if we say the first speaks to the opportunity to do things differently, and not just in the post-financial crisis world, but in the post-apartheid South Africa and in our new economy, and then if we look at a bit further back in history. Um, this is actually a frivolous poem, apparently, um, but it's about, it's about choice and it's about uncertainty. So I'll, I'll read it quickly and then I'll get into the more kind of meaty stuff. Two roads diverged in Yellowwood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. So, one of the issues with ESG is an economic one. We, as, a, as economic agents, have been operating in a paradigm where one kind of capital has mattered, financial capital. Those of you who have done a lot of reading about sustainability will be familiar with the Hartwick <laughs> Rule, which says that financial capital is perfectly substitutable for other forms of capital. Therefore, um, this perfect substitu substitutability means that you can, have, you can actually have capital growth forever. Now, if you take a slightly more holistic or less exuberant view around capital, you say, well, actually, the steps can go up, but they can also go down, because maybe these capitals aren't perfectly substitutable. So maybe finance, you can't replace whales with financial capital, or rainforests, or people's education, or health. And so you get into this dynamic where we are operating under immense uncertainty around capitals that are often very difficult to measure. This is a frequently, a frequently discussed um, statistic. It's in the SICA integrated reporting document. And I wanted to kind of unpack a slightly different view on this. So, so basically what this is, is it's the constituents of the S&P 500, um, tangible assets versus intangible assets. 1975, tangible assets were 90%, 2010, 10%. So what is that saying? So in the psycho documentation, we take a view that it's saying that companies and investors are starting to internalize some of this uncertainty. But there's a different view. You could, you could say companies and investors are starting to take bigger bets. And if you look at it in the context of the Twitter IPO, for example, maybe that's true. Um, so I, th I just wanted to, to kind of raise that as a, bit of a, as a bit of a red herring out there. If we, if we look at our local universe, we've got, this is 2010 information, it was the best I could, uh, uh, the most recent I could find. Um, <coughs> we've got about 5.6 trillion um, institutional assets under management. 1.1 trillion. <coughs> are earmarked for ESG investing. Of that 1.1, and again, this is just my own research, we could, we could identify 25 billion focused on ESG activities. So, you know, yes, there's a kind of a conceptual buy-in. Yes, there's a in growing understanding of the need to start internalizing some of this uncertainty, but are we really getting it right? So, we at First Rand take the view that ESG is evolving under severe uncertainty. We, don't, we therefore don't like to think that we've got all the answers. 
and we're trying to develop a capability that will enable us to respond to this uncertainty as it evolves. Now there's a lot of debate around this slide because I wanted to kind of refer to a bit of a metaphor around our business as a bank being a bit like gardening because when you put capital on something, it grows, a bit like when you put water on a plant, it grows. This was the, uh, the most sort of creative I could get past my studio designer. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm going to kind of get into now how we as a bank see this ESG capability evolving in the business of lending. A few years ago, I think some of the people in the room were in Washington when a lady from the Bank of America stood up and spoke to, to an audience of 200 people, including Gordon Brown and some other big names. And they, they spoke about the solar panels that they'd put on uh, US military bases. And I thought to myself, what? I wonder what percent of their balance sheet that is. I wonder if it's more than 0.1%. And, and, and so I'm, I want to come at this from a slightly different angle and say, we're not going to talk about our direct impact. We're going to talk about the way we apply a balance sheet. So if we look at a, a kind of a funding process, and, and this is real, okay, this isn't me sitting in, a, uh, sitting in my office drawing pretty pictures, this actually happens at first round. Um, you, can, you can integrate ESG criteria into deal origination. Um, and it's actually reasonably easy. On a, deal, uh, on, a, on, a, on a deal form, you actually just add a question and say, are there any social or environmental issues that will impact the sustainability of the transaction? Um, you, you then have categorization that requires a bit more work because you've got to go through the different kinds of transactions out there and say, well, is it an A, B, or C? But that, that can happen at the next step. If, if you have an environmental impact, you, you have a, an environmental and social risk assessment, which will then inform an in-house view. That goes to a, a credit application process and where a credit committee will actually sit and consider the, cre the credit credentials, including the ESG credentials, if there is um, remedial action required, an action plan can be, can be put together with covenants and monitoring and evaluation uh, can take place through the, the course of the deal. Now, why does this matter? And why does it matter in our economy? It, it matters because it gives us the opportunity to adjust pricing based on ESG issues. And again, you could say, <coughs> is this just John sitting in his office having these ideas? So, we had set up this process, uh, I went and I sat with our wholesale credit committee which does a lot of the big project finance transactions locally and um, on the Afri elsewhere in the African continent and it actually happens, okay? They actually do have ESG criteria discussed at, uh, at credit committees and it actually does affect pricing and, and that for me is, is very exciting because that's when we start getting into a space when we start to achieve this internalizing in a meaningful way. It's not just taking a punt because we think the market's going to like something. It's actually meaningful metrics and forming uh, meaningful discussions. So just on, on the, the, the governance approach. Now, people, people in businesses often think that, the governance, that governance is more of a compliance function. It's been absolutely critical to us to, to, for getting ESG embedded in the organization. And uh, there's, a, there's a nuance that we've recently just, just kind of unpacked internally that's been even more important. And it concerns the role of the audit committee versus the role of the social and ethics committee. And I'm not sure whether other companies are going through a similar thing, but we had a huge amount of application of mind to this issue because you say the audit committee has to sign off the integrated report at the end of the year. So does your ESG data flow through the audit committee? Yes, it should, because it needs to say, well, these numbers are accurate or they're not accurate, and the audit procedures are appropriate or they're not, not appropriate. So, so we, we kind of have taken that approach um, and, and have also started, started embedding these ESG reports at our franchise audit committee levels. So it actually flows through the entire audit committee structures um, on an enterprise-wide basis. But then you ask, what is the role of the Social and eth Ethics Committee? Because is it just seeing the same information again? A and the answer is yes and no, because it's receiving the same information, but its responsibility is not an assurance one, it's an oversight responsibility. The Social and Ethics Committee c 
can actually make changes. An audit committee is there to say the numbers are accurate. And that's a, key, that's a key function, because if you don't have accurate numbers, then you're kind of just shooting in the dark. If, but the audit committee shouldn't theoretically start making calls on whether the numbers are good or bad. And that is the role of the Social and Ethics Committee. So we've put in a lot of work to embed these processes, oversight and assurance at, at franchise and group level. And it has been, it has been a big advantage because Although the reports might not be the most colourful reports that, that these committees see, um, or, or necessarily the most material reports in some respect that, respects that these committees see, they're essential for building the capability, because better information enables ongoing improvements. Now, if we talk about the, the, the board holistically, um, each of these committees have a role to play in, in ESG. Um, I'm not going to sort of bore you with, with the details <coughs> on each one. You can ask questions later if, if you want to get into that. But the, the kind of key message I, I'm making here is that the, the accuracy of information is critical to actually empowering the entire organization, not just a sustainability unit or a sustainability uh, champion, but the entire organization to make more effective decisions based on a broader view of capital. Um, so where does this leave us? Uh, ESG is a journey to enable economically efficient long-run capital allocation. Now, when we read about ESG investing, and I've got some questions for, for the audience as well, um, we, we kind of read these things about that say, we've got this opportunity to invent a new economy. We've got this opportunity to build a social pillar in our economy or, or reduce um, environmental impacts or, or work towards more environmental sustainability. But what does that really look like? Y you know, wh what, are the, what are the tangible things that we should be putting our pensions into? You, know, you often ask the question, I, mean, I get grilled occasionally by, by people asking questions about first rand, and then you, you ask the question, well, do you know what your pension is invested in? And often people don't. And so what are the things? So, so we think that there are sort of four key pillars where this is not for the whole economy, this is for, for first, in terms of first round interaction with the, the economy. Um, we think that innovation is an underpin to our ability to do both the upside and the, the below the line stuff well. So I think innovation is sort of starting to migrate more <laughs> into the, the regulation and compliance space. Um, and and that's, a, that's a very positive for us in a, in a highly regulated industry. But we're talking about education, infrastructure, entrepreneurship, and access to financial services. So look, as a bank, obviously it's, it's sort of principally focused on, on credit, um, but we've got two kind of key pillars to the thing. The first is an exclusions list where we actually won't do business with certain kinds of industries. Um, and, and that's quite an easy one because if they fall into A, B or C category, and the list has got about, about 15 different kinds of industries that we won't do business with, you know, then, then it's automatically out. Um, and then we've got quite a, quite a structured process around you know, actually identifying the social and environmental risks in transactions and, and in lending. Um, the one thing about this though is that you, you, I don't like the checkbox approach. So if you, because it, it, it kind of narrows the, narrows the scope, and I'm not accusing anyone of taking it, but obviously it's a logical it's a logical way to start solving the problem. It's to say, we know that there are risks in, these, in, in, in lending to companies with these kinds of ESG credentials. Are we going to rate sort of A, B, or C? And how it started at first round was a lot more discretionary. So we, we actually identified you know, kinds of projects that would require further investigation. Then you actually appoint people to investigate and to form a view. And, and it's a big thing going on in companies, you know, particularly with, with proxy voting as well, being, being outsourced, is that you, you, you kind of, this discretionary, the, the, there's a lot of power in discretion, and, and having an accountable person actually stand up and say, this is what I think. You know, I've looked at this thing, this is what I think, rather than, you know, well, it's in category A, and it's got a bit of B and, and some C, therefore I think, you, you know, we, we get to uh, it, uh, an, loss given default of, of X. Um, so I know that doesn't fully answer your question. The, the big transactions, they're, they're, 
it is more discretionary. On smaller ones, it is a bit more of a check checkbox approach. We, we sort of started this process at 10 million US dollars and up. In certain parts of the business, we've migrated to, to 50 million rand, um, and, and in some instances below that. So it's a work in progress. Obviously, you can't overload the organization's credit capability um, all at once. It's, a, it's, it's about sort of building it up over time. Um, Jonathan, uh, Alan Greenblow from Today's Trustee magazine. I don't know whether there have been any significant no votes at first grand shareholder meetings in the past few years, uh, but if there has, how would you respond to it? And, and even theoretically, if there are significant votes, uh, how would you respond? Do you just say, okay, that's a no vote, but we've still got a majority, so let's move on? Or do you make a point of engaging with the shareholders who voted no? Look, I think, so first round is, it prides itself on taking a view. Um, and, and one of the, the things about taking a view is you need to then engage. Um, we, we had, a, we had a, a vote at our AGM last year, um, a, a question about remuneration. I'm also expecting one of those. <laughs> and, and there was this very question, you know, to what extent will you engage on, on the no votes? Does it practically happen? Yes, it does. Are there investors that we haven't reached? Yes, I'm sure that they, that they are. But, you know, we, I think as this space matures and a, as governance becomes more and more important for banks, we are starting to take a, a stronger view that we, we believe in, in the way that we run our business and we believe we understand our business. Therefore, we're going to stand up for our right to take a view on certain things, but that needs to be coupled with appropriate engagement. I'm not sure if you have if there's some history to your question or, or whether it's uh, you know whether you've had a particular experience that yes, that. Yes, that no, I, I, is a group governance. So um, I just thought that there would be some uh, lesson in the way you behave for other companies to behave similarly. Thank you. I thought that maybe there'd be no <laughs> a negative experience somewhere. No, we, look, it's very difficult because, you, you know, and, and Corley and I debated a lot because our chairman's not independent. Now, when we look at first round and we look, like we put on our most objective hats and we say, who's the best person to chair this board? We believe that it's Laurie de Pinal. So, you, you know, but it's not, but in terms of the SRI um, index criteria, you know, there, there's, there's this independence thing. So, so we've sort of given a lot of application of mind. We think we have to be honest with ourselves and with our stakeholders about, you know, why we make cer certain calls. But, you know, as a company, you need to make certain calls and you need to own, you need to own the business. So that sort of maybe provides a bit of colour to where that comes from. Honeen again from Berman Gilfillan. Hi. A uh, quick question on your capital allocation slide. So I noticed in the process you said there's ESG criteria at the screening stage when you price the deal and before you decide when to, when to lend, whether to lend, how much to lend. Then your next uh, redeemable point seems to be in covenants. And when those are breached, that might trigger accelerated paybacks or whatever you agree in, in the loan docs. What is your view on, on staggered payments of a loan in especially high risk uh, projects, which would typically be infrastructure as an example, and retaining some leverage over the way in which uh, the borrower is spending your money um, and requiring them to report much in the way that NGOs report to donors on their activities and the responsible nature thereof. Because the conversation in the human rights space currently is once the money changes hands, you lose a lot of leverage. Uh, is there a conversation around what can be done to retain more leverage after you've given some money over? I think it's one of these prevention is better than cure questions. I, is that you, you kind of, you don't want to get into a space where you start saying, we're going to do business with you, but we're going to do it slowly because we don't really trust you. You, you know, obviously it happens and, and, it, and it can work like that. And it does work like that. But, y you know, a, f a, a more desirable approach is to actually have a proper understanding of what you're investing in up front and a, and a proper relationship with the counterparty up front. Um, so the answer is, you know, yes, it, it, it can and does happen. Um, is it the best case scenario? No, you'd rather, 
yeah, you'd rather go into into the transaction knowing what you're going to get out of it and get that out of it. It's like, and, you know, people like certainty. Um, hi, Jonathan. Uh, my name is Wasim Token from Lachai Securities. Um, and uh, you know, just just a question, kind of leading on from from what you said about Loretta Pena and, and and independence of the chairman. Um, just um, you know, some 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 commentators have have kind of talked about African Bank and uh, the potential for one uh, too little financial experience to have kind of played a role in a lack of oversight capacity on of executives and and a lack of uh, risk management and monitoring. And then uh, 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 an excessive executive kind of uh, complement on, on that particular board. For example, four out of 11 of, of African banks' uh, directors were executive there, and that also playing a role. Um, so um, what's your view? Uh, obviously, um, kind of generally accepted governance practices, uh, more independence is better. But there is some research to say that for banks, more independence actually compromises um, the, the, the need to get financial experience and that kind of compromises the, the whole monitoring and risk management processes of the port. So what's your view on that and also in the context of first rand potentially like the presence of, of, of founders on the board and the presence of executives on the board and, and the impact on, of that on kind of oversight of the non-executive and independent directors? So. You know, th this comes up a lot, and you talk about creating an environment where you've got a healthy tension. So you've got a non-executive non non board members who ask management difficult questions that management answers easily. Um, and and that's, your, that's your kind of I ideal environment. In, in a, the case of a bank, you know, the control environment is, is, very, comp is very complex. FNB has been going since, nine, since 1838. So you've got a very, very complex and, and, and uh, control environment with a lot of history. Now, when you get into asking the board member or the chairman of the board to sign the financials, it helps to have people who really understand that, who, who really understand how a bank's control environment actually works. Um, but the challenge that the non-executives have is that they're being asked to be more responsible but less in control. So, so they, they've got to be more responsible but, but more independent at the same time. And I think that you can't be, I think you can only do that if you do have a, a, a very deep understanding of how the particular industry or even company works. So in our context, you know, we've got a, a, f a few directors who really understand the bank. Uh, one of them is an independent, non-executive director, our audit committee chairman, um, y you know, who has a, was a registrar of banks, really understands control uh, issues, and there is a healthy tension between management and, uh, and the non-executives. Does it make life more difficult? Yes, it does. But do you need it? Absolutely. You, you, you have to have it. Um, you, you can't be in a situation where you, you just kind of have limited assurance. So management give limited assurance to the board and the board say, okay, you know, management have to say, we think, this is what we think. We think it's okay or we think it's not okay. Does that answer? Yeah. <laughs> oh, did you want more on first strand specifically? Yeah, yeah, essentially that's, that's the only Look, I, I'm disinclined to sort of get into the details of individual directors, uh, you know, but, but the answer to the question, do, does having that depth of skill, you know, add a lot of value? Yes, it does. Um, does it prejudice independence? I think one of the things that the market is not listening to now or not thinking about enough now <coughs> is that independence is also a state of mind. You can have, you can have an, uh, an director who's the most independent in the world in terms of all of the, the tick boxes, but maybe is influenced by management in some strange way, and, and therefore it doesn't apply their mind in, independently. So, you know, we've got two tests. We've got the state of mind test, and, and we've got some real governance around, around that, and we've, got, uh, and, and we've got the sort of the, the criteria test. You know. Okay, I'd just be interested if you could give a bit of color on the whole state of mind test, because, I mean, to my mind, that would be quite difficult to identify. I mean, from the outside, essentially. Yeah, so, so the way... Can we move on to the last question? 
Okay. Certainly. So it, it comes down to this healthy, healthy tension thing again, because your, your, your managers don't set pricing, they all make proposals. So we, we have trained people on, on understanding the ESG credentials of loans. Obviously when you've got things that are very clearly regulated, then it's easier, because you know that you, you know what the, the kind of risk of default would be based on, uh, on the risk of the, the ESG issue going south. But you then get management to present to a credit committee, which is constituted with people who have an independent state of mind, as well as uh, you, you know actual management people, and, and you debate it. And, and that's in practice, you, you know, how the numbers are, are sometimes arrived at is that you, you actually debate it and form a view based on ba based on your best knowledge. And it's again, it comes back to this thing of taking a view. It seems to me that there's a lot. In, in, particularly in the ESG space, there's a, a lot of sort of leaning towards let's quantify and clarify and then assign a predetermined value based on those on the on, on those criteria. But <coughs> this is it's too it's too complex for that. People, you actually need to sort of build on people's um, <laughs> you, you need to build on people's sort of innate understanding of their business and hold them accountable for it.